What's going on? Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Get started here in a couple minutes. Hey, Stanley. Yeah, you guys are on mute. So basically what we're going to do is uh, if anyone has a question, um, you can either put it in and just type it in, or if you want, you can raise your hand and I can allow you to talk. And then you can actually ask your video or you can ask your question um, over video as well. How much for the Sackick jersey? Um, Sackick jersey, I don't know. I got it many years ago and had it signed by him personally, so it didn't really cost me anything. Has your board compiled a list of week-by-week -week stats of sales, new listings, prices? How does that compare to last year? We received this information from the Ottawa Real Estate Board just now. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. I'm tracking the weekly data, actually reporting that for the Bank of Canada because they're obviously trying to keep track of the impact towards the housing market. Um, so yeah, right now, weekly, the latest numbers, so I am tracking them. I'm tracking right now, weekly in Vancouver, and then John Pasalis is doing that for Toronto. Um, they're actually mirroring each other quite similarly where Vancouver uh, sales are down on a weekly basis, about 50%. So that's kind of the trend that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. And new listings, I would say on average right now, um, they're, they're dropping about 60%, 60 and this is on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, so that's kind of where we are in terms of market activity. Prices, it's kind of impossible to actually track on a weekly basis. It's kind of irrelevant because the mix uh, of housing is gonna change, uh, obviously. So. Uh, long story short is activity is down a lot, um, but we're seeing basically inventory is still growing. Um, so you're actually seeing the months of overall inventory for sale, for example, for Vancouver over the last three weeks has gone from about three and a half to seven. So inventory, mm -hmm. months of inventory for sale, which is usually a pretty good metric is basically doubled. So that's uh, obviously going to start putting pressure on pricing. And I think that's what we're starting to see uh, right now. Michael asks, uh, do you see this correction in real estate as a bottom up decline or the opposite, i.e. luxury declining first, FYI, I'm from Vancouver. Um, oh, someone asked where's my beer. Um, I think that, um, the luxury market's obviously still going to get hit the hardest. The thing is the luxury market's already down 30%, right? Give or take, depending on, on the area. I mean, West Van, you have some of those properties are down 40%. Um, so those are probably going to get hit a little bit harder because I think the financing for those kind of homes has become even more difficult. Um, and then at the same time, there's only so many buyers with 5 million bucks or that can qualify for a 5 or $6 million purchase. So I don't see it being impacted as hard as the the low end, but I still think that the low end is at the same time is more susceptible to people being laid off. Um, so I think that could impact the condo market. Are you getting or hearing of listings that used to be Airbnb homes being listed? Uh, not really. Um, none of my clients um, none of the realtors that I've really spoken to, it's kind of a hard thing to track, but I think that we are seeing some of them pop up in the long-term rental, uh, platform. Mark asks, do you think a modern debt Jubilee is actually doable? Would it, wouldn't it take many hundreds of thousands per person? Has a country ever done it? Um, back in over finance, over modern or not or modern history, but over um, history, there has been debt jubilees that was a regular thing in certain um, certain uh, histories, segments of history. Do I think it's realistic? No, not really. I mean, I think it's a nice logical argument. I think that we're kind of seeing parts of, of a debt jubilee already being Im implemented though. You're already hearing about like policymakers, talking about um, 
talking about, um, you know, forgiveness of student debt. Um, so I think that we're starting to see sort of this debt forgiveness is kind of already starting to play out. Um, so I think that it's going to happen eventually. It's uh, to some degree. I mean, I don't think it's going to be a full on debt jubilee. And obviously policymakers don't like change. They always try to keep the status quo. So Hart asks, do you, me- you mentioned that in U.S., feds help stock market up, and in Canada, government supports housing. But with the stress tests and the various taxes, at least in Vancouver, how's government supporting housing prices here? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, so you can say, how is government helping housing here? Okay, well, let's look at the first steps that they've already taken here in this pandemic, which, again, you can argue whether it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. The reality is it's what's been done. So OSFI has already lowered the capital stability buffers to 0% from two and a half. So basically this allows the banks to mm-hmm. reduce um, their basically the rainy day fund. So it increases, basically allows increased liquid liquidity so they can essentially keep lending if they need to. Um, CMHC has now brought back their um, 2008 financial crisis playbook, which is the insured mortgage purchase program. Um, that's basically, um, securitizing uninsured mortgages off the bank's balance sheets and um, securitizing them. So basically, again, frees up liquidity, frees up some of their bad mortgages that they maybe don't want or want to get off their books. Um, mortgage deferrals, we've seen that six months mortgage deferrals upward, you know. So that's that's support right there. If you didn't have any of those policies, I mean, housing would be way down um, already. So... Um, that's that's what they've done and like who's who's to say again i'm not saying this is going to happen but who who who's to say that you can't bring back zero down 40 year amortizations and remove the stress these can these can all be changed tomorrow i'm not saying that they're going to be but they can easily do it if they want and i suspect once this economic crisis eventually passes whether that's 12 months or 24 months um eventually they're going to want to restart and juice the economy. And one way to do that is obviously through housing. And I suspect that lending conditions will eventually be loosened and they are going to try to re-stimulate housing. I think that's quite a ways off for now um, until this sort of thing settles down, but they have no other choice. If they want to restart the economy, they're not, they never take the hard route. They're always going to take the easiest route out, which is basically just to try to reinflate housing and, and keep the status quo. What happens, Michael says, what happens to condos if no one is there to pay strata? Um, well, you'd see stratas basically, um, stratas can foreclose on people too. So they can put, they can put uh, liens on title against your property and eventually they can request to the courts to foreclose. And I have seen that not like recently, but I have seen it over the years. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I suspect that is going to happen because obviously stratas aren't deferring people right now. And I suspect they don't really have the ability to do that. So um, yeah, yeah, I can just see that. I don't think it's going to collapse stratas by any means, but where do you see the pre-sale market going, especially with so many assignments and multi-owner mall developments? Um, yeah, I think the pre-sale market's extremely vulnerable. I've said this before over the last year and a half that it's basically it's basically a it's basically a futures market. Um, so it's basically an agreement to 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 purchase um, you know somewhere down the down the road at, at a, an agreed upon price, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a futures contract that works you know magnificently. You know you're able to leverage up. You know, you can borrow the down payments. The developer doesn't ask where you get your down payment from um, in terms of the pre-sale deposits. So a lot of people just speculate on pre-sales and in a rising market, it works really well. But uh, obviously when things reverse, um, so there's going to be problems. It's the reality is there's going to be problems people with people closing. Um, you know, if you had a job, when you bought your pre-sale, you know, 18 months ago and you had a job and the bank says, yeah, you should be approved. You're, you're good to go. When you go to close on that, you have to get re-qualified. So the bank's going to um, do an appraisal on the unit. So if you paid 700 and the bank thinks it's worth 
650, they'll give you a loan based on 650, but they're also going to want to make sure that you have a job. And so if your income or your employment status has changed, then obviously, you know, your ability to get a loan is going to change as well. So there's going to be people that won't be able to close. And we're starting to see some of that. Keep in mind that the number of assignments for sale right now is at all time highs. Um, so we saw this with the last boom in housing, which was pre 2008 is the number of assignments uh, ramped up just prior to the, the downturn. Um, and again, that's just the cycl cyclicality um, of housing and, and booms and busts. So yeah, I think there's going to be some, some problems and some, some, some distressed sellers in that environment. Uh, but you're also going to see developers pull back on new project launches naturally. Would you recommend fixed 2.69% or variable 2.35? Um, that's a tough one. I think I don't see the Bank of Canada raising interest rates anytime soon. Probably at least a couple of years away. Um, so it kind of depends on your comfort level. If you're planning to hold it for at least five years, then you might just, if you, and you want to sleep at night, maybe just lock into 269. But um, yeah, because that variable at two, three, five. I mean, the Bank of Canada really only has another 25 basis points to cut rates. So I don't really see that going a whole lot lower. How long do you think the landlords can keep themselves afloat and not lose their rental properties? And how much would that affect the rental market? Uh, it's hard to say. I think it's a case by case basis. Obviously, obviously, there's a lot of leverage in the system. So basically, like the more leverage that you have in a deflationary environment is you know, more difficult to get through. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to see some investor units come onto the market. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with new listings once things start to settle out and people get more comfortable with actually putting their places on the market. So I'll be keeping an eye on that, but that's just me speculating at this point. Pat says, is there going to be a rush to the exit when the deferral period ends? Uh, I think you're going to see more listings potentially, but I think you're more so I'm more concerned about, you know, if you're deferring your mortgage is a decent probability that you're probably a little bit more distressed or a little bit more vulnerable to the shock. So it's more so like what happens after that deferral. Um, if you miss a couple more payments, then they're going to start the foreclosure process. Now keep in mind, Foreclosure, foreclosure process in BC is usually on average is between 12 to 15 months. So, you know, it, it's such a long process by the time somebody misses that payment to the time that, you know, that goes through the foreclosure process is, is, is quite a long time. So um, in terms of seeing foreclosures ramp up, that's going to take at least minimum 12 months. Richard, given many individuals being able to work from home these days due to quarantine and companies having to evolve and adapt to technology changes, my assumption is there will be less demand to have to go into work slash, for example, having to go downtown. Do you see the working class moving further out to the suburbs due to this? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think that over the long run from a secular standpoint, I'm actually fairly bullish on the suburbs. Um, if you actually look further ahead, I think that we're going to see, I mean, how far away is, for example, how far away is autonomous vehicles and more rapid transportation and obviously the ability to work at home. I think that's like a secular thing where technology is moving at such a rapid pace that I think that people, you know, if you can live in, for example, if you can live 45 minutes out from the city, but you can take an autonomous vehicle and just work on your laptop or your phone while you're in the car, I think that it makes it more desirable um, to live maybe further out. So I think that could be a secular change. Are you seeing any interest in, are you seeing any shift in interest to suburbs? Single family houses with yards from downtown high rise condos. No, not really. Not at this point. Um, I think that people are still going to gravitate towards what they can afford. Right. I mean, 
you know, if I don't think just necessarily people are deciding to buy condos versus detached because they necessarily prefer condos. I think for a lot of people, it's just what they can afford. Right. So I don't really see that changing. Nando says, would the rate of people trying to enter the market have any effect on minimizing a downward trend? I don't really know what you mean by that. What the rate of people trying to enter? I mean, obviously everybody wants to enter the market, but do you have the, do you have a job to, to enter the market and will the bank actually give you a mortgage? So this is one of my things is like, everyone's like, Oh, well the market's going to drop like from a, from a economic fundamental standpoint, they say, well, the market should drop 40 to 50% because fundamentals suggest that based on incomes and what's happening in the economy, it should drop 40 to 50%. But what they're failing to understand is that like the banks can, again, can change policies. Policymakers can change policies at any time. And, and if they, if prices were to drop 40 to 50%, let's just say they do, um, good luck for the average person, good luck trying to get financing in that kind of environment. It's probably not going to happen. Um, so that's kind of my thought. So yeah, same thing in today's environment. If you have an unemployment rate of 20%, it doesn't matter how many people want to buy. Um, you need a job to do that. And the bank has to be, even the bank has to be comfortable that need money. Uh, someone asked, have you heard of anyone being refused a mortgage by banks just because he's now considered a higher risk works in a sector where employment is unstable? Yes. hundred percent. This is the big thing, right? Um, again, you can have a job today, but it, it's to the banks want to lend you money. Um, so, you know, yeah, if you're, if you're a pilot, probably not. If you work in the hotel industry or tourism, probably not. If you're a realtor that made, you know, on average, 300,000 bucks over the last couple of years. And they're going to say, well, your salary is probably going to cut in half this year. So we'll qualify you based on 150,000. So, you know, this just, they're just basically trying to reduce their risk. Right. So um, that all gets reflected in my opinion, back into the market pricing um, when banks tighten. Uh, someone asked this, someone asked if you're signaling cash, when's the best time to buy a detached house in Toronto? I'm not a Toronto expert, not going to pretend to be, but um, I think that in general, the unemployment rate as a whole across the nation is going to be in the double digits. I think that's going to weigh on housing in general. Um, so I think time's on your side. Just, you know, try to, no need to rush out there. I mean, you know, if you're entering and say multiple offers to like today, which I'm still occasionally seeing to me is, is pretty stupid. Um, but you know, if you want to buy today or tomorrow, just look for a seller that's willing to negotiate, try to get a good price. And, and, um, that's really all I can say. I think there's probably some downwards pressure in Toronto, obviously. Um, and I think that's going to take time to, to filter through. Someone asked, were you able to find an update information on the unemployment numbers or unemployment claims? Uh, yes, I have that right now. It is. We are sitting close, to almost at 8% unemployment rate. Um, keep in mind, that's kind of a lagging indicator. Again, we are going to go into the double digits. Could hit as high as 20% potentially. Um, so that would be up from our lows of 5%. Um, I think that would be an all time high actually. Someone asked if you had purchased a lot with cash out in the Fraser Valley would previous to COVID, would you recommend building or wait and hold off to wait and see? Depends what you're trying to build. Um, are you building to live in? If you're building to live in, then you may as well get on with your life. If you're building to flip it, then, you know, that's probably going to be a pretty tough sell um, in terms from a margin perspective um, because that house is probably going to be done. Let's say the house is done in 12 months, whereas the market can be in 12 months. I have no idea, probably lower than it is today in my opinion, but 
someone asked farmland does it have a future as an investment i'm pretty bullish farmland i think if you're entering into an inflationary regime um i think that farmland is going to do pretty well well ryan asks will foreclosure percentage increase how can a home buyer get access to foreclosure properties um yeah of course foreclosure numbers are going to increase they're coming off record lows so they were starting to rise over the past 12 months and uh obviously when you have an unemployment rate again in the double digits for what's going to be a prolonged period of time like there's not this is not a v-shaped recovery it just won't be um despite what you know the optimists want to tell you um that the for, number of foreclosures are obviously going to rise. I think, I think I true, I truly believe that employment or unemployment is actually more detrimental to housing than interest rates. Um, so I think that the foreclosure numbers are going to increase uh, significantly. If you want access to foreclosure properties, it's not a whole lot of good sites, but you can message, message me, send me an email and uh, I can get you set up on like a foreclosure list. Uh, someone's asking my general view on commercial real estate appraisers during this time. Should appraisers be more prudent on values, even though it's still a lack of comparable sales showing declines? Yes, obviously. Um, it's hard to put a valuation on when there's no comps and you don't know what landlords, how many landlords are going to be paying and, and who isn't. So for example, um, there's a report that came out from JLL, a huge commercial property brokerage. They said that in Canada uh, and some of the, the large malls, Van, uh, Vancouver Pacific Center, for example, uh, only 25% of retail um, retail tenants paid their rent in April, 25%. So uh, again, how do you put a valuation on an asset when, when you went from basically, let's say, 98% of your tenants paying to now just 25, um, very hard to put a valuation on that. So that's why banks obviously don't really want to lend on commercial assets right now because nobody knows what the values are. Um, and how long is it going to take to stabilize that asset class? Nobody knows. Could be, could be three months, could be 18 months. Scott asks, how will the Canadian dollar affect the real estate market in Vancouver with foreign buyers if our dollar tanks? Uh, good question. Um, obviously, my view is that the Canadian dollar is going to go lower. I mean, it's what, 71 cents today. I think I, my call has been 65 cents personally. Again, not the expert there, but that's just my view. Um, I think it's obviously beneficial for foreign, foreign purchasing, but again, you have to remember there's still a 20% foreign buyers tax. So it kind of negates some of that influence. And at the same time, when people are more reluctant to say travel, um, and depending on what China does with their capital controls and all that, obviously they have a lot of problems with their economy right now, trying to get back up on their feet. I just don't really see this as an environment where you see a whole lot of inflows um, currently. In my view could be wrong. Any chances of the Bank of Canada going to zero interest rate policy? I mean, I think they're already there. They're at 0.25%. And they've already said that that's their zero lower bound, which basically means they don't really feel those, they don't really feel there's any benefit to going from 0 0.25 down to zero. So I think this is the effective lower bound. So um, they're just gonna try to stimulate, I think through more um, bond purchasing. Did you salvage the recording with Keith Dicker? No, unfortunately not. Sorry, Steve. You talked about pre-sale and condo market softening. How do you see detached? Um, I think it's going to drop pretty much in line with condos. I think entry level detached is going to hold up stronger, obviously, than the higher. The higher up you go, the, the, the fewer buyers there are. So there's usually more downwards price pressures. Um, so like there's still a bid for an entry level house with a basement suite, but for some of these luxury houses, they basically just go quote unquote, no bid. And um, that's where you see the big declines, right? Like I said, anyone that's been paying attention, like a lot of the luxury markets are already down 30%. I mean, again, you go to West Fan, they're down, you know, 40. So 
you know, this West Van drop another 20%. Now you're talking about a 60% peak to trough decline. Like that's, that's, that's pretty rough. Jim asks any chance the banks increase deferral period. Um, yeah, I think it's possible. They've, they've kind of mentioned that they might be open to doing it. It really just comes down to they need, they need support from policymakers to do that. Um, you know, the banks don't want to cut their dividends, but in Canada, the banks don't want to cut their dividends because, you know, a lot of retirees are relying on that income stream. But the reality is if you look at banks globally, a lot of them have already cut their dividends for the year. So I don't know if you keep deferring, if you keep continue to defer mortgages, I think that you're going to have to cut dividends. Um, so either way, there's, you're going to, you're going to be impacting someone. So yeah, I don't see the, I don't see the deferrals going on forever. Um, again, I think there'll be a little bit of grace for certain individuals, but um, for others, the bank's going to start getting a little bit tighter, I think. Chad says, I just had a form with CPA BC's economist giving us consensus from the major banks saying a drop of four or 5% GDP this year, but then a bounce right back to three to 4% gain in 2021. Uh, are you seeing the same? I don't know. I think it's not going to be a V-shaped recovery. I think it's, I think what I tend to agree is that it's kind of going to be <laughs> an L-shaped or, you know, someone says a Nike swoosh that seems realistic to me. Um, again, you can say three or 4% gain. That's just a rate. Of, that's just a rate of change, right? It's just a year over year change. So is that possible? Sure. Maybe. Uh, but you're obviously have, you know, it's a weak base effect, right? So it's like, you know, again, if GDP drops say 20% in the second quarter coming up and then, you know, Q3 is going to be up say 10 or 15% quarter over quarter. It's like, of course, because you've restarted the economy to some extent. Um, doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't mean it's going to be rip roaring. It's just going to be uh, a tough couple of years. David says, if I can get a condo 10% lower than the market value right now, should I get it or should I wait on the lower expectation? The market will go lower. Um, I just, I just don't think that you can time it personally. Um, I think you kind of just have to look at it on a month to month basis or even a quarterly basis because housing moves so slowly. And I actually think that as you guys probably can attest to that you're following along, it's like financial markets have deviated from the real economy for, for quite a while. And they're even more so when you get into all this quantitative easing. So you almost have to look at what policymakers are doing, right? Like, you know, let, let's say condos are down 10%. And then CMHC and OSFI and everybody decides that we're going to remove the stress test and bring in 40 year amortizations. Then I'd probably be a buyer at 10%. Um, so I kind of continue to monitor it. I mean, again, I don't think you can really time it. Right? If you, if you, if you're down 10, 15% and you think that there's really good value there and, and you're going to be there for the next 10 years, I think that's pretty good. I mean, my, my downside, is not that large in my opinion, just because I think policymakers are going to try to try to juice things as much as they can um, to put a floor under it. And that's already what we're seeing. Any idea when courts are going to start processing foreclosures? Uh, I don't, but that's the big thing, right? So it's like, even if you want to foreclose right now, you can't. So that, that's just devastating for a lot of these private lenders um because every month is just lost interest payments and you're just delaying it and then like obviously i just think there's gonna be a backlog once these courts open everyone you know th these private lenders that were backed up everyone's gonna be trying to start these foreclosure processes and um yeah i don't know that's something i'll be watching very very closely Someone asked me what I think the future of the Canadian dollar in the next two quarters. I think I already answered that. I think it, 
I don't know about the next two quarters, but I think it goes to 65 cents. Like what? Like I don't know. What's the what's the what's the bullish? What's the bullish case for the Canadian dollar? I'm, I'm struggling to to see it. Uh, oil is nine percent of GDP, roughly. Um, that's basically been eviscerated. And then the other segment of our economy is basically housing. Um, and even if house prices don't necessarily really fall that much, um, new housing starts are going to drop significantly. Like um, projects. You know, new projects being launched, that's a huge part of GDP. So, and then I'm thinking like, even for people, like even for the average Canadian consumer, like, you know, over close to 65% of GDP is consumer spending and you have an extremely leveraged Canadian households. Um, and then you're going to have a double digit unemployment rate. I just struggle to see where the growth for the Canadian economy is going to come. I think the U.S. was much better positioned coming into this. Um, so well. someone asked, do you have any data on private, private lending? Uh, what percentage of folks were basically funding down payment using private lending? I don't know about funding the down payment, uh, but in terms of private lending, um, the Bank of Canada's estimates are um, that alternative lending uh, shadow lending, if you want to call it, makes up between 10 to 12% of new mortgage originations in Vancouver and Toronto. Um, so it's a, that's a sizable, that's a, that's a decent chunk of, of new originations, um, for sure. So yeah, someone else is asking, can you talk about mix and private lending drying up? Um, yeah, they're obviously tighter. Um, you know, it's the marginal credit, I think, that is is really the problem, right? If, like, a lot of people, as long as housing is going up, there's always going to be access to credit. Because, um, like, a, as a second, as a private lender, if you say, well, you know, I'm happy to go in, in, and give you a second mortgage on your property because, like, the housing market looks stable and, you know, it's kind of going up, you know, whatever, 5% a year. Like, to me, that's a pretty safe bet or the private lenders view it as a safe bet. So you can kind of delay people from foreclosing, but I think as soon as that prices start reversing, like it just, it screws that whole system up. Um, and then it just kind of creates these self-fulfilling feedback loops. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be a problem. Uh, Someone asked, do you have any thoughts on luxury luxury apartment market? I went to many pre-sales in the last six months and they are trying to sell high-end apartments in the two plus million dollar range. Given that you can get a house for that, I can't see where the demand has come from. Yeah, that I've talked about that for a while, that that segment of the market is basically dead. Uh, a lot of those luxury apartments, the reality was is they were sold, a lot of them were sold offshore, road shows in Hong Kong, Singapore. Um, and that bid's pretty much been, I wouldn't say non-existent, but pretty like close to dead for the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. So the pre-sale market was already struggling. Um, and there's just not a lot of demand, right? Like, like in Vancouver, I mean, any, the cheapest project right now in downtown Vancouver um, is pre-selling at about 1700 bucks a square foot. So there's just not a lot of demand for that unless you kind of go overseas to higher net worth investors um, so yeah, I think that's a market that's really going to struggle. Uh, someone says, when do you think a good time to buy a house in Vancouver West that is over three mil, four and five mil? I mean, I think it's already a, a good time. If you ask me, it's down 30%, you know, try to find a desperate buyer and negotiate the price down even more. Now you're talking a 40% drawdown to me. That's pretty good. I mean, I, again, I don't know. You can try to time it if you want. Um, trying to do that. I, I don't really have a whole lot of guidance other than, like I said, I think that over the next 12 months seems like there should be logically, there should be downwards pressure. Do you think the government will rescind the school tax or foreign buyers tax to stimulate the economy? Uh, I can see the foreign buyers tax being removed at some point. Uh, probably not in the foreseeable, probably not in the next 12 months, but um 
they're going to try to juice housing at some point. And um, yeah, I think one of those ways is to try to do that through, through for banks, it's going to be to try to ramp up their foreign lending programs. And um, so I think maybe they'll probably lobby with politicians um, to try to ease those foreign buyers taxes. Um, that'll be tough though, because I think politically that, that will be very tough to, to sell. Uh, we already see Metro van suburban single detached prices in the fall of this year. Uh, personal view again, uh, this is like probably me crystal balling. I've, my guess might be as good as yours, but, um, well, my view is that housing doesn't move very quickly at all. Uh, I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions that people have is that the market has become, I wouldn't say, oh, it's become relatively liquid. Um, and people think that, well, because of that, I'm going to offer, you know, 10 or 15% below the asking price. It just doesn't, just doesn't work like that. Um, you know, sellers are very reluctant to cut their prices. And that's why you tend to see, um, you tend to see that housing markets go through corrections for several years. Um, and we can see this in the luxury market, right? I mean, the luxury market peaked in 2016. It's been, it's been four years. So um, yeah, it hasn't really gotten any better. So yeah, I, where I see them in, in, in the fall, maybe down, I mean, I would say right now prices are down two or 3%. I could see them being down, you know, another couple percent. So, you know, now you're talking five, six percent from the peak. Someone says, looking at the macro picture, as you like to do, is this our time for deleveraging? like the U S did in 2008, but we skipped that re we skipped that round this time around the BOC and the government are supporting citizens with free money subsidies, secondary market purchases of every kind and backstopping the banks with this amount of support. Are we going to skip this round as well? Um, I don't think that we will. I think that we might not get like a painful deleveraging like they did in the U S but I think households are going to be trying to repair their balance sheet over the next couple of years. Like these $2,000 subsidies, for example, like that's just, that's not, you know, it's helping people pay their groceries and maybe part of their rent, but it's not stimulative. Um, it's just trying to plug a hole and just trying to plug a hole in a sinking ship. So I think that Naturally, like, I mean, I know people personally that are dipping into their RSPs to try to get through this. So I think when you come out the other side, people aren't going to be desperate to go and spend a whole bunch of money. And they're not going to be desperate to go and buy a new car and a second condo. I think they're going to be more conservative with their cash. I think this is, this is like a once in a generational event, in my opinion. I mean, like, Again, you have to think about it. GDP is going to contract, you know, probably 20% in the second quarter. The unemployment rate is going to go to 20% or give or take. Um, I think that's going to change people psychologically. And I just think that we're just kind of entering a new regime and it's going to be hard to say what the future looks like. But, you know, obviously I'm optimistic. I think that there's still a lot of innovation and technology and but uh, I think that I think behavior, human behaviors might change to some extent as much as policymakers are obviously going to try to encourage people to continue to take on debt because that's, we have a monetary system that is based like credit creation is basically debt creation. So, uh, I mean, they're going to try to incentivize people to take on debt, but I just don't know how willing people are. And it's kind of what you've seen in Japan and Europe. I mean, we've had rates at zero with lots of QE and um, you know, people just, when you're so indebted and you don't have a desire to borrow and leverage up, there's just, you can't really stimulate. Someone asks, you always talk about monetization of debt. What exactly does it mean? Basically just means that basically 
central banks are essentially uh, how to explain this in simple terms they're essentially purchasing the debt essentially um so you know the government issues like for japan for example like um the government issues a bunch of bonds to basically you know facilitate fiscal spending so they're issuing debt and the central bank is buying that debt and basically at some point the bank of japan is eventually going to own the entire japanese government bond market and they're probably just going to end up cutting a check and saying your debts are forgiven um because that debt will never be repaid it just it cannot be repaid period um so that's basically them monetizing the debt um Do you think suburbia will gain more value than before and downtown properties will decrease in value more due to people working from home? Kind of touched on an earlier question. Um, personal views in the short term, I actually think the suburbs are more prone to downturns. That's what history has shown us because in the suburbs, you typically have a, this is just reality. You typically have a more blue collar working class. Um, and so those jobs and those individuals are usually more susceptible or vulnerable to economic shocks. And so that's what we saw, at least in the U.S. housing bus, particularly, is that the suburbs um, tend to get hit harder um, in downturns. And, you know, for example, because there's a lot of this basic, what happens is the drive to qualify, people get priced out of Vancouver, they move to, say, Surrey or Abbotsford, prices go way up there people start speculating on where prices will go up next and so it becomes it tends to be a lot of speculation in those suburban markets um and um and there's actually been a lot of building in, the, in so a lot of the new construction for example under construction units that are going to be completing over the next couple of years a lot of that construction is in the fraser valley it's not in the city of vancouver um so a lot of it's in the, in the valley. And so you have to think about it too. It's like, even from a foreign purchasing perspective, like for an investor, for most investors, like higher net worth individuals that actually have like legitimate cash in a downturn, like most of them they're buying in the city, in the core, you know, they're not like a foreign buyer, like some like wealthy Chinese guy, for example, it's like not to be prejudiced, but let's just say a wealthy offshore investor is not buying condos in Abbotsford. They're probably buying, you know, they're buying downtown pre-sales at 3000 bucks a square foot. And that's what they're buying. Will property taxes be increased to make up municipal deficits? Yeah, probably. I think that, um, Housing is easy to tax, um, it has nowhere to go. It's an immovable object. So typically speaking is when governments go bankrupt or close to it, that's usually the first thing that they'll tax. Um, we certainly see that in places like Chicago, Illinois, um, where the city's basically bankrupt. They've jacked up property taxes. And yeah, it's just an easy thing to do. I mean, <laughs> Um, for sure. Someone asked, so this is my favorite question. Got this all the time. Mario asked, when is the bottom for Mark? When is the bottom of the market for single family homes in East Vancouver? Where are prices now? Three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years. I'm not even going to answer that because I have no idea and I don't, try to like guess and forecast and time markets. I can't do that. Nobody can. Anyone that tells you that they can is, is, is lying. Um, like I said, my personal, if you, if you want my personal view on just the general market, uh, I, I'm not that bearish. I think prices drop 10% to 20%. When all is said and done, I think that could take, I think that could take 18 months, maybe two years. Um, like I said, housing is very slow moving. Um, again, fundamentally, should it drop more? 
Yeah, of course it should. Um, when you have a 20% unemployment rate, should housing drop more than 10 or 15%? 100%. But the reality is, is central banks ha- and policymakers have basically distorted financial markets. There's no, there's no, there's no real price discovery mechanism anymore. And you can see this, for example, in the stock market. Um, it's just what it is. Um, unfortunately, I don't agree with the moralities around it, but um, financial markets are not what they were, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, like, yeah, that's, so that's my view. Scott, my man, and it's even less here in Toronto, Eaton Center. Yeah, Scott, I don't know what you're talking about, Scott. Trying to also do anything crazy. Uh, yeah, a lot of people asking questions on pricing. Like I said, my that's my view. Um, publicly, you've heard it here. I think that to me, the downside, I think, is my my bearish outlook is probably the downs, like the worst, the peak to trough. So this is like. Again, this is, and I don't usually like to like guess and forecast, but like my personal view, like if I'm sort of playing with my own money, I think you could see across the board as a general board, like whether that's one bedroom condos, single family homes, like the benchmark peaked trough, I could see maybe 20% over the next couple, year and a half, two years, for example. Um, that's my view. I, I don't even know if it's going to hit 20 I don't know, like for me, I'll have to wait and evaluate it. But like for me, like if I see something that's down 15% and a good property, like I'm probably going to pull the trigger. Um, but again, could be wrong. I mean, I know people think that it should drop 50 and then we've talked about this already. I think markets aren't based on fundamentals anymore, anymore unfortunately, because of the intervention, which again, I don't agree with, but that's what they're doing and there's no point in fighting that right it's like again i just think it's the same thing as the stock market talked to all my finance buddies about this it's like you know do i think that, that we retest the lows for example in the stock market yeah probably i think that that logically makes sense but i just think at what point like well, what point does the market decline where the fed will then start buying equities like they're buying junk etfs i mean so they're literally basically, they're basically rewriting the rules of what the central bank can purchase. So, and I think this is slowly on the path to basically MMT style um, policy. Someone asked Stevie, Stevie, why Steve Eisenman or Joe Sackick? Joe Sackick for sure. <clears throat> Matt asks, what impact do you think the current environment will have on the Whistler market? Oh man, that's a tough one. I don't know. I'm, I'm just purely speculating here. Uh, I think those resort, man. Yeah. I think those resort, those resort areas, touristy, it's more of a luxury purchase. Um, I think those get hit pretty decent. I think a lot of it depends on like, oh man, like a lot of that depends on travel, right? It's like a resort town. Um, So you get a lot of like, obviously foreigners coming there to go ski and and bike. And, and so, I mean, imagine that Airbnb is getting decimated over there. Obviously the hotels are getting decimated. I think that and and they depend a lot on foreign workers and yeah that's that's an interesting market i don't really have too much too much of a view on that other than i'd be very curious to see where it ends up because it was showing it was quite resilient up until about you know starting to slow over the last six to twelve months (sighs) 
<sighs> Someone asked me, I know Edmonton and Calgary are not your markets, but by how much do you think their condo and detached market might be impacted? Marginal decline or significant? Uh, I own in Calgary, actually. Um, man, I think that I think those markets are already pretty beat up. Like they've they they've been like I, so. For example, I bought my house in in a good area of Calgary. I paid less, not much, but slightly less than the perch than the seller that, that bought it in two thousand seven. So that's thirteen years of no growth. So yeah, I think their housing market's going to be impacted, obviously, particularly with the oil market. But I don't know. I almost think that markets like Vancouver and Toronto that are that were quite frothy coming into this that have fairly you know high debt levels. I actually think those are more vulnerable than than Calgary and Edmonton, personally. Again, I could could be wrong on you know, but I think I don't think anyone really knows. But that that's my view. I mean, I don't know. Like Calgary to Edmonton, basically, you know, what are they down? 10, 15% over the last, you know, what, 10 years sort of thing? Like, I mean, that's pretty bad as it is. I mean, especially when you adjust for inflation. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they drop another 5%. Like I said, housing is not a, like, not a liquid asset. It doesn't really move that quickly. Someone says, can you elaborate and discuss your article earlier this week related to the Great Depression and causes and the differences and similarities to today's crisis? Uh, obviously, I wasn't around in the Great Depression. I've done some studying and reading on it. Um, similar in terms of like the drawdown in, in sort of GDP and uh, unemployment. Very, very similar in that aspect. Similar in the aspect that central banks had basically interest rates at zero and they also did versions of quantitative easing during the great depression uh, they actually didn't do enough and that was kind of that was kind of the knock on policymakers later on is that they should have done more and early so i think right now as the policymakers are as pelos would put it um no nobody ever got mad at a fire a fireman for using too much water or whatever so uh, yeah, I think that's, you know, we're more proactive today. We're also not on a gold standard. <laughs> Bitcoin or gold. Uh, I don't know. I have both. You know, I think my personal view on Bitcoin is it goes, either goes to zero or it goes like to a hundred thousand. I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's an in-between. At least gold is more. We know gold is 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 has been a has been money, real tangible asset for thousands of years. Uh, yeah, thanks, Daniel. That's an interesting comment. He says, "My wife and I are both in banking, and we've already seen appraisals come back five to five to ten percent less." and purchased yeah uh, it's tough to be an appraiser right now i mean even as a realtor like for me when i'm pricing when i'm pricing you know listings sellers that want valuations um it's hard because you know especially if they have a timeline hey we want to sell we want to get this thing moved it's like well i don't it's hard to really say what price is going to move it because we just we just really don't know there's so little selling and and you know, the market's really changing on a, on a weekly basis. Good question. Thoughts. Uh, Michael says, thought on immigration levels going forward, have we reached the peak and will we get, will we go net negative on immigration? I.e., people on temporary visas leaving Canada, how much would that add to the drop in real estate value? Man, this is one of the ones I've been talking about for couple of years. Um, one of the things that just it kills me inside is mainstream economists 
everybody likes to project so that everybody extrapolates into the future. Human, human brains have a tendency to do this as we extrapolate recent performance into the future. So everyone just says based on recent immigration trends by 2030, we need to have this much housing, this many people and this much construction. But like what they don't quantify is that like, again, I know it's hard to like predict, but like there's always economic shocks. There's always like a recession you know, we have a recession on average every six to eight years. There's always things that are going to interrupt that. There's there's always secular changes. And one of the secular changes that was so obvious was like, clearly we're entering a regime of like deglobalization, nationalism. Um, you can see that with the anti-foreigner policies. Like, this is not a Canadian thing. This is like, a, this is a global phenomenon. So I just think that like the openness towards immigration is just becoming less and less popular and i think that governments at the end of the day they're going to try to win votes and i just see i just think we're going towards a more closed border society so and and one of the things that we can see over time and over history is that and my buddy ben rabidu has talked about this a lot uh it, you know he runs north cove advisors he so net permanent or sorry, t temporary visas. So basically temporary, temporary workers. Uh, what you tend to see is, is they are cyclical. They follow the business cycle. So basically when the labor market is tight, that program basically ramps up and we funnel in basically more um, immigrant workers essentially come in for sort of fill the void. Um, and so that not only creates a demand for housing, but it also pushes up on wages. So obviously I think a tight labor market. So now what happens on the reverse, you actually see those turn from net inflows to net outflows. And so you're going to see is like when you have an unemployment rate again in the double digits, whether that's, that's a 20% unemployment rate or a 10% unemployment rate, like that's a lot of slack in the economy. Like, like what, like no immigrant is going to come in to that program to come to Canada. There's no jobs. And also it's not going to sell politically because like if you're going to have social unrest, you have an unemployment rate in the double digits and you're filling all the, the open slots with temporary work visa permits, like it makes no sense. So, and we saw that in like, for example, like Spain, I think Spain's immigration was growing at 5% annually prior to their housing bus and those inflows turned into outflows. So net outflows of people. So that's, that's obviously a headwind for housing that very, very, very few people have actually quantified and the mainstream uh, economists have not talked about it whatsoever because I don't think they actually, uh, sorry, if you're a big bank economist here, but they don't, they don't think from real life terms, they kind of live in this hypothetical world this ivory tower so to speak so uh, someone says all central banks around the world are printing money and with the canadian dollar being low do you see vancouver housing market spiking like we did in the last couple of years um the current printing is not stimulus it's merely again as i said earlier you're feeling a hole in the boat. Um, this is not enough stimulus to offset the lost revenues and the lost GDP. So this isn't stimulus. Um, and central banks, they don't technically, they're not technically printing money. Quantitative easing basically, it's basically an asset swap. So essentially what it does is it's creating reserves. So it's creating bank reserves. Um, so the idea behind that is when you create bank reserves, it's they're hoping that because the banks have excess reserves that they'll then lend out these excess reserves. Um, they'll be more incentivized to lend. But again, like as a bank, like why would you lend money in today's environment? It makes no sense. And even if the banks said, okay, we'll lend money. It's like, does anyone have a desire to borrow right now? Like why would you, why would you lever up and go purchase a bunch of, investment condos when like you don't even know what the future looks like you don't know what the what the rents are going to look like you don't know if, if you know the tenants that you put in there are going to pay so it's just that's not stimulus it's not money printing again i think eventually we're going to get inflation um because we can't we simply can't tolerate 
years of deflation. It would just be devastating. So I think they'll probably end up rewriting uh, monetary policy, like the regulations around um, central banks. Uh, what are you doing with your cash? Um, buying some stock. Um, I have a lot of gold position, some little bit of tiny bit of Bitcoin. Uh, I'm still in a huge cash position because I think that we're going to get, this is a bear market. In my opinion, it's a bear market rally. I think that at some point we're going to probably retest the lows. It may not get there, but I think we'll get fairly close. I think right now it's a, it's a, it's a bear market rally. Um, so I'm still keeping a fair amount of cash to, to deploy. I also think there's going to be some opportunities in real estate, obviously. Whether that real estate opportunity is in Vancouver, Toronto, Calgary, U.S. multifamily, like I'm pretty agnostic. I just like, I, for me, it's just like, okay, where do I feel there might be opportunity? I, I don't really care where it is. I just think that in general, there's going to be asset classes on at a discount. So I think having cash uh, for now, especially in a deflationary environment that we're in, is um, probably a good position. Have you seen any, have you seen many condo or townhouse owners dealing with the insurance crisis layered on top of the unemployment situation right now? Uh, the insurance crisis is still pretty new. So yeah, I think it's a problem. It's kind of stacking on, but I think the media made a, probably a bigger deal of it than it really is. Like most people don't really factor it in. It's also hard because you can't really get a read on stratas in terms of how much their strategy, uh, their insurance is going to go up. Sometimes it, it, truth of the matter is it kind of just hits people out of the blue. You can do your best. You can review the documents as much as possible. But, uh, yeah, that's a, it's a tough one. I'm not really. Oh man. So anything you were looking at in the markets or stocks you've picked up lately? Uh, some gold mining stocks. Uh, I've been long gold for almost two years now. Um, <laughs> individual stocks. I mean, I'm drinking a Budweiser right now. I bought some Budweiser stock uh, last week. It was down 40%. Um, I don't know. I don't want to get too much into specific stocks. I'm not really... Like, a stock picker. I think it's, <laughs> I usually just play ETFs cause I try to, I usually, I'm more of a thematic investor. I usually just look at it from like, so I, I trade a lot on like hedge eye and what they do is they're macro investors. And so they look at the economic cycle and say, which sectors perform well. So like, for example, for hedge eye right now, they, they're not long a whole lot of stuff, but what they are long right now is that they're long utilities, gold, um, short-term treasuries. Um, so that's the kind of thing, right? And then you, you move into more of a growth inflationary environment, like they'll get long tech, for example. So that's kind of how I you know, position my own portfolio. Uh, someone said, oh, I just subscribed to Hedgeye. How active an investor are you? Active trading or macro long-term? Yeah, I'm not really an active trader. I just don't really have a whole lot of an edge. I think that to be an active trader, you have to be, you have to have a lot of time and yeah, I just don't have a lot of time. I, my main business is real estate and um, so I work a lot. So I don't really, I don't really have time to be actively trading in and out of positions. So I more take, I take positions basically and I, I hold them not for long periods of time per se, but I have a longer outlook. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie, 
Stephen Pelosi is retiring in June. What kind of legacy do you believe he'll leave on the Canadian real estate and the broader economy? Uh, <laughs> from a personality perspective, I actually kind of like him in terms of I feel like he's down to earth. Um, like he's actually kind of a funny guy if you think about it. Like, you know, you can tell he's a guy like you probably want to have a beer with. But uh, the legacy, I mean, I think that he ultimately, he ultimately follows the Fed. And, you know, I don't think he had, really has a choice that, you know, I think, I think any central bank, they left rates far too low for, for too long. They created more systemic imbalances. And then obviously, you know, having this exogenous shock just put us in a really, in a worse position. Um, yeah, I just think as much as they wanted to probably raise rates, there's just so much debt that you just, you couldn't. And we saw, we saw how housing performed when rates started to creep up five year, when Bank of Canada started to hike rates and five year fixed mortgages went to three and a half, three point six percent 3.6%, um, housing activity dropped off a cliff. And so, yeah, you just, you, when you have these level of house prices and these levels of debt, you just can't normalize. So yeah, I don't know. I think he left ultimately, he's going to be remembered the guy, he, you know, he's going to be remembered as the, um, the candy man as uh, Andrew Bell and BNN called him. William says, so are you saying you would feel comfortable investing not on fundamentals and rather on a drop from a high watermark? Uh, to some extent, yes. I mean, obviously I still think like right now from like a stock market perspective, I think people are underestimating the economic ramifications of what's happening. So I think that's partly to play out, but again, like, you know, under, like, again, I'm not the expert for saying, say like the stock market, but like, if you read a lot of people and I subscribe to a lot of different, you know, individual thinkers, like you could make a logical argument that the stock market should drop when you have this kind of like economic shock, like the stock market probably should drop 50 to 80%. But like, that seems unlikely based on this manipulation in the market. So it's like, yes, I will obviously include some of the fundamentals, but I'll take it with a grain of salt, knowing that there's a lot of liquidity being pumped in. So that's my view. That's my personal view. Again, I could be wrong and I'm happy to debate that, but that's just my view. And that's kind of how I'm uh, positioning my own portfolio. Someone says, uh, Kyle says, I sold Victoria that ran up fast over the four years and passed off the hot potato, <laughs> paid off a house in Frederick and New Brunswick and bought a duplex in the same city. Do you have any thoughts on cheap East Coast real estate? Uh, I've looked at it. I think that it could, it depends what kind of investor you are. I think it offers, um, I think it offers uh, obviously better cap rates, better yields. Um, but the, 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 pre, the price appreciation, in my opinion, I don't really, see, I don't have a strong thesis for price growth there. So just a different investment style. And I don't think, I don't think there's a right or a wrong. Uh, Jeff, what's up, buddy? Bitcoin, yeah, going to the moon. Uh, would you advise an investor to sell or simply take a wait and see approach? I don't, it depends on what your wait and see approach is. I mean, wait and see, like, where do I think the market's going to be in three to six months? I mean, I think that in my view, personally, I think that's a pretty obvious thing. It's going to be lower. So, you know, if you want to wait two or three or four years, then wait. I mean, it depends what you're looking at. I mean, you know, if you're looking at a million dollar loss, like do you cut your loss now or do you just hold on and try not to realize that loss? That's, 
that's a tough that's a tough one to answer it kind of depends on your personal situation like that's what we're seeing for example like in west vancouver a lot of these luxury home builders these guys that built houses on spec they don't want to realize the million dollar loss they don't want to realize the two million dollar loss trust me i know i've made offers on them for clients um they'd rather they're literally some of these guys are literally they have the capital and the ability and the, some of them have the patience They've been, some of these guys have been, have been listed for three years and they still haven't sold and they could be waiting another three years. So maybe at some point they'll capitulate or maybe they'll just continue to hold that and sit there as opposed to realizing a $2 million loss. Um, it's kind of crazy, but it's just what it is. Do you see policymakers, Stefan says, do you, do you see policymakers continue to prop up housing after COVID-19 subsidies since the economy is going to be weak after and everyone who applied for mortgage deferrals or other assistance won't be able to claim that emergency benefit anymore? Uh, I think they're going to try to prop up housing, but again, I don't, I don't think they're going to be entirely successful. Like you can't, you can, it's still a free market. I mean, they can intervene as much as they want, They'll help put a floor under the market, but I don't think you, you can't prevent losses. Ugh, man. Andre said, what market will experience more of a drop in low prices, lower mainland, Vancouver Island, or Kelowna and the Okanagan? I, I don't really have a view on that. I think the Okanagan is kind of susceptible to be honest. I don't think they have as strong as of a, of a employment sector there. Um, personally. Uh, where are your pos goal positions? Physical, ETF, miners, juniors? A little bit of both. I don't really, I'm, to be honest, I'm not really dabbling, dabbling in physical just because like, I don't think my net worth is large enough that I feel it's a need. I'm more just trading gold. I think gold is going to go up. So I'm more interested in like trading it from like an ETF perspective along with some miners. Um, like I think I can benefit just as well off say going long some gold miners, like even yeah, some junior miners. Uh, I think I can do well there. I don't necessarily have the desire to go out and buy Physical gold, you know, hey, if I had a net worth of, you know, 10 million bucks, I would probably be buying some gold, um, like physical gold. U.S. cash or Canadian cash? U.S. cash for me. Thoughts on inflation its timeline? Probably two years. Um, I think it's going to take couple of years to get the jobs back and to get the economy back to some rem some resemblance of strength i think it's probably a couple of years and it'll take some time for policymakers they're going to throw everything that they can at the wall i think their current versions of nfqe aren't really stimulative they're not really money printing quote unquote so i think right now they're still fighting deflation um, until those structural issues get fixed uh, or until they change policies, um, I don't think you're going to see inflation. Uh, I don't really have any thoughts on major residential REITs, to be honest. I mean, I'm from a secular standpoint, I, I'm not very bullish on, uh, on uh, retail. I don't really think I'm not that bullish in office either. Just going through some of these questions. Uh, do you think this, this is a good question. William says, do you think the stigma attached to renters will change? It feels like Canada discusses and holds home ownership in higher regard than anywhere else in the world. Uh, 
I think it probably will over time. I actually, I mean, I've said this for, for a number of years and this is prior to the coronavirus, but this just is, this space just can exacerbate it that the peak for home ownership rates um, is here. It's been here for a couple of years. So I think you're going to continue to see a decline in the number of home ownership. The wealth gap is going to widen and um, yeah, I just think that, you know, people maybe even after the shock will reconsider how much debt they want to take on. Do you want to take a million, two million bucks in debt to get just to own a home? Um, so yeah, I think home ownership rates continue to fall. And with that, I think stigmas around home ownership will, or around renting will fall. Uh, Tim says, have you looked at the Japanese asset price bubble in the 1980s compared to the impact the Chinese have had in the global real estate market over the past 20 years? Will China retreat and, and their capital back to China like Japan? Um, that's something I've thought about for, for a couple of years because uh, it, it is very, it resembles a lot of Japan from the 80s. A lot of leverage, a lot of debt, a lot of that same buying spree where everybody sort of thought, you know, Japan was going to take over the world. Everyone thought China was going to take over the world. So, yeah, I think, the, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. My personal view is I'm not very bullish on China. And um, I think that, I think people that are, I think people that are hoping for like China buying spree 2016, you know, 2.0, I, I don't, I don't see it. Do you have any simple or practical tips or advice in navigating surviving through this recession? Cash. Cash. I don't know. Building skills. So become more valuable in the workspace. Like, you know, if you got on if you're unemployed and you're looking for a job, like what, what skills do you offer? Like what, you know, what makes you more valuable? So I think just improving yourself, self-improvement, I think is, is going to be beneficial. William's got all the good questions here. Do you think that there's a wave of civil unrest as a result of the increasing wealth gap, both in Canada and the U S yeah, there is. I think that this, the, 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 the inequality gap is obviously was widening prior to this. And I think it's just going to get wider. So you're going to see a consolidation of, of businesses. You're going to see a consolidation of, um, yeah, just, just more wealth accruing to the top, right? So who, who has the ability to buy stocks down 30 40%? Who has the ability to buy real estate down 10 15 20 25%? Usually it's higher net worth individuals um, that actually have savings to deploy in a downturn. So I think that just creates um, you know, larger inequality. Michael says, what is your opinion on rent prices moving forward in Vancouver? Uh, I've said this before. I think they're going to move down. Not huge, but there's going to be some downwards pressure. So, you know, like, and we were already starting to see the condo, the rental market here peaked over a year ago. And, you know, like, for example, if you're renting a one bedroom downtown for say 2000 bucks and the guy moves out, and you got to fill that vacancy in three months. I can see that failing at 1850, you know, even 1900. That's, 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 that's impactful. Um, and we saw that in Alberta. So I think people forget like in Calgary, a lot of like rents came down double digits. Um, and they still haven't quite recovered from their peak. So yeah, I think that um, people are underestimating that rents are tied to the business cycle and the economy. So if you have, again, high unemployment and weak wage growth, like obviously people that get rehired right now, like they're not going to be going to their boss and asking for a raise. So I think that um, that all gets reflected back in the rents. Uh, 
Uh, Matt says, has Canada ever can see prices move to the extent that cities like Phoenix and the U.S. during the Great Recession? So I could, but anything's possible. It's not my not my personal view. That was a bank solvency problem. We don't have that right now. This, the banking system here is much more resilient. And again, I'm not saying that the banks here are perfect, but it's kind of just like this. It's this big, the big five basically control the entire thing. By cash and just keep keeping money in the high interest savings account. Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously you want to deploy that cash eventually. Um, you can't sit on cash for several years. I mean, you got to, at some point you got to buy some assets. Um, but I think deploying it strategically, you know, slowly uh, is important. And then having those cash reserves, because I mean, it's possible we're going to probably have a weak economy here for some time. So, you know, yeah, I think you want to be, you still want to have some cash reserves. William says, does the crony capitalism bother you? Yes, it does. Uh, obviously, I think it's morally, morally it's wrong, obviously. Uh, I don't really know much to say, but I think everybody that follows my work, I think it's pretty disappointing to see. Um, but yeah, the system is so leveraged that these guys just don't see the pain would be so great. And I don't think anyone's willing to take the medicine, unfortunately. Um, Okay, Mike, I think this might be one of the last questions here. He says, Mike says, you talk about it being good to have cash, but there's also a fear of inflation, which is devaluing cash. Can you reconcile the two opposing ideas, how long we might have to know we should get the heck out of cash before it's devalued? Yeah, so I think you're in a deflationary, de deflationary environment for at least the next 12 months. Um. So yeah, it's going to take some time um, before you get inflation, right? You don't just switch, you don't just flick the lights from deflation to inflation. So I think it takes some time for the recovery to kick in. And um, so yeah, I, my, my view is I don't think there's anything wrong with holding cash right now and for, you know, probably the next 12 months. And uh, like I said, you're eventually going to want to deploy slowly and strategically into assets. Like I said, I'm deploying, personally, I'm deploying some right now into the equity market. Um, but um, still cautious because I still, I still think there's going to be drawdowns and other opportunities in, in varying asset classes. So, um, and I still think like even, even in, even when we recover, it's, even when we do recover, there's still a good explanation to have some cash. Like you never want to be 100% fully invested and have no rainy day fund. So I think you still always need some cash, even though it might be devalued slightly. There's a, you know, it's an opportunity cost. Yeah, Natasha asked, um, you think industries that will be hit the hardest for the longest hospitality, tourism, service industries, you have a workforce that is a large renters that in Metro Van, the rental market is in big trouble. Uh, how much will the impact detached houses with income suites? Um, yeah, like I said, I think there's downwards pressure on rents. Um, I think that particularly when you start to get like an increase in vacancies and people have more options, that the usually the ones that are generally hardest hit this is my kind of experience with with looking into calgary for example was that the basement suites usually get hit the hardest because like you know like people have options like the last thing they want to do is like be stuck in a basement suite forever so like if they see prices come down in alternative options like for an apartment for example i think that people will jump on that so 
the basement suites usually uh, come off a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that's pretty much all the questions I got here. I mean, I got a few, I don't know if I got it to everybody, but uh, Chris says, do you have any particular thoughts on investing in the Canadian stock market given the current situation? Do you think Canadian dollar will lose quite a lot of value? Yeah, I'm not like, I'm not really heavy into the Canadian equity market. I just don't really see a lot of opportunities. I don't know. I'm just like, yeah, just not very bullish on the Canadian economy. I think that U.S. equities will perform better. Mm, dun, dun, dun. Eric says, in your interviews, you sound like you're less bearish on the bubble deflating in a big way over the years. Do you think you might be more educated now and can see the bigger picture? Or could you be suffering from recency bias seeing Vancouver has not deflated in the last few years despite the fundamentals? I ask this with all respect. Yeah, that's a good, fair question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think obviously I'm continuing to get more educated and... I mean, I don't think anybody really predicted the extent that policymakers would go to, for example. But at the same time, to say that uh, Vancouver is not deflated, I mean, luxury luxury real estate's down 30 to 40%. So I'm not really sure how you can say that. I mean, even condos, for example, like condos from the peak are still like, at one point, condos have come off about 10%. And then they regain some ground. So they're still down. Like if you bought a condo at the peak, you're still actually, you're still down. So, and then, I mean, we had like in 2019 sales hit all time record lows over the last 30 years. So I don't know, in my opinion, that's, there was definitely a correction. I mean, was it as bad as maybe I had suspected that? I don't know. I didn't see sales. I never thought sales would, would go to record lows. Um, Yeah, I mean, and then obviously here we are now. I mean, you know, luxury again is down 30 to 40. If that thing drops another 10%, I mean, now you're talking 50%. You know, if you had asked anybody, any single person in 2016, do you see these prices coming off? You know, for example, you see like West Vancouver, the thatch price is coming off 50%. Nobody, nobody would have everyone nobody would have agreed with that um someone says who are the people paying 15 to 20 percent over 2019 assessment for houses and condos these days i just saw a few sold today uh assessment values are horrendous uh i know that the general public likes to look at them as a barometer but i i almost never look at them um they don't really mean anything it's, they, do, they don't. First of all, they don't factor in renovations most of the times. So if you don't pull, if you don't pull a permit, how's BC assessment going to know that you did a renovation? They have no idea. What are your thoughts on tenants being able to renegotiate their their terms with their landlords? I'm going to attempt and renegotiate my rental agreement. Uh, yeah, probably as a tenant, probably a good idea. My personal view as a landlord would be, do you want them to move out? So let's say you're paying 2000 bucks a month. Do you kick them out or let them leave? And then it could take you, let's say a month or two months to fill that vacancy. That's $4,000 in lost revenue. Or did you take a slight reduction and keep them in there? So that's kind of my view. Uh, I think that we're pretty much good. We see the, uh, uh, 
Okay, Matt. Um, if real estate for the quote unquote affordable product in Vancouver has climbed 100% in say seven years, why only 20% downside bottom? Uh, I just think that uh, there's a lot of policymaker intervention. Um, the, it's just, it's, 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 it's kind of like a sad reality when you think about it, but it's like the system is basically, and I, I think yeah, Nassim Talib to this best, the guy that wrote the book, Black Swan, he's, he said that you'll come to realize that most things in life, particularly in financial markets are basically Ponzi schemes. And that's basically what like the housing market, it's basically a Ponzi scheme. Like you have to have prices continuing to go up each year. So that way you can get move up buyers, you get people moving up the ladder. You can have rising wealth effect. You can have rising, a rising tax base um, and obviously inflation. So yes, yeah, so it's basically a Ponzi in nature. And so, you know, if, you let the bottom fall out. Let's say you let housing decline 50%. First of all, it's massively deflationary. Secondly, that kills consumer spending. Third, that basically destroys the Canadian banks who basically run our economy and our world um, because their collateral is the asset. So why would they let their asset decline 50%? If they can do their best to lobby the policymakers, Mm -hmm to help support them, why would they want their assets, their collateral to decline 50%? So that's kind of my view. That's why I say that as, as much as I think it should probably drop more. I just think that logically just what it is. All right. I think that's it. 6.30. If there's one, I'm going to do, I'll do one last question. If there's any last questions fired in right now, I'm going to do one more and then I am going to sign off. Uh, Okay. You've asked this question a couple of times, so I'll get to it. Do you see any similarities between Japan, the eighties and nineties in Canada now from high debt and interest rates going to zero and economy as well as real estate, never, ever recovering to those 30 year highs later. Um, so in my opinion, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's ill-conceived or I think it's naive to suggest that it cannot happen. Okay. Like to someone, you can't, you can't put a 0% probability on it, but I do believe that the probabilities are extremely low. Um, I just think that, if you continue to get like deflation and stagnation like this, I just think that they're going to find a way to rewrite the rules of the game and of the system. Obviously Japan hasn't quite figured that out, but if other central banks get on board, like, you know, if the, if the fed and the, in the EU get on board at some point to rewrite this and, eviscerate the stagnation and the debt. I think at some point they're going to figure it out and they're going to change um, central bank policy to try to spur inflation. Again, I still think that's some sort of MMT, modern monetary theory, which is basically a direct, a direct monetization um, of government debt that that will spur inflation eventually. And again, I think that's probably a couple years away until they get through those um, policy changes. Um, yeah, I just, that's just not my, my view. I think again, there's, there's obviously, it, you know, you can't say it can't happen, but I think the probabilities of that are extremely, extremely low. Oh, okay, guys, that was good. I need another beer after this. Um, thanks for coming on. This is going to be put on YouTube as a recording. So if you missed part of it, um, or if you want to go replay some of it, I'll put it on my YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And uh, we'll probably do a couple more of these um, in the near future. I'm also planning to have on Jared Dillion. Um, he writes the Daily Dirt Nap newsletter, famous on Twitter. And yeah, smart, 
used to be a trader for Goldman. Smart guy and um, entertaining guy for sure. So I'm going to have him on, I think on May 5th. So I'll put the information out on that. So if you want to listen to that, I think it'll be a good interview. He's, he's a smart guy, smarter than I am. So it uh, should be a good back and forth. And um, yeah, any, any, yeah, we have previous sessions. Someone just asked, they don't have previous sessions. Um, my recording with Keith Dicker, unfortunately, I uh, forgot to hit record. And uh, so that won't be going up, but I will have further interviews with other people in the finance space. So that'll be good. So, all right. Take care guys.